this is Never Mind the Ballots. I'm Harry Cole. We're bringing you a brand new show looking at all things politics with my team from The Sun, with no subject off limits. Coming up, I meet the man who, if the polls are even remotely correct, looks set to be Britain's next Prime Minister. What's really going on in Westminster? Our political experts lift the lid. And who's hot? Who's not? We read the political weather, taking the temperature in Parliament. And giving their verdict on it all, we have our very own Sun Cabinet of real-life readers to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Another week and another round of Tory leadership plotting. After months languishing in the polls, even good news on inflation has done little to move the dial for Downing Street. The Conservatives have dropped to 19% in one poll. It's panic mode. Will they even make it to October for their planned election? Rebel plotters are thrashing around looking for any lifeboat they can find. First it was Suella, then it was Kemi, and this week it's Penny. But deep down, most Tory MPs I speak to, they know they've left it far too late. The iceberg is coming. The rebels say things can't get any worse for the government, but of course they can. Just five years ago, the Tories slumped to 9% in a national election. Things can always get worse. Another change of leader would leave the party a laughing stock. But one man already laughing is Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer. Today's Sun readers will grill the man who insists he hasn't already measured the curtains of 10 Downing Street. Critics say he stands for nothing, said one thing to get elected Labour leader, and then ditched every single pledge he made. Even his closest allies admit he's not a political animal, but a safe pair of technocratic hands. While the Tories slump, why does it feel out there there's no real enthusiasm for Starmer, beyond him not being the other guy? But has Sir Keir Starmer got what it takes to win over Sun readers? This year, a nation will decide. It's time to strip out the waffle. It's time for politics in plain English. This is Never Mind the Ballots. <music> Joining me to run through all the week's biggest political stories is our very own deputy political editor, Ryan Saby, and our political correspondent, Noah Hoffman. Ryan, you've been around long enough. Can you remember a week like this? Well, it's always pretty febrile in the Conservative Party. You go back to the time of Theresa May when you had that. <laughs> Don't. That was <laughs> those terrible days. Oh, that was. And you had the, uh, the no confidence vote where um, she just about scraped through it. Now, I think the difference with Rishi Sunak this time is there doesn't seem to be the energy. There's a lot of desperation out there and frustration amongst Conservative uh, MPs, but they haven't got the energy to go through with it. Um, so I think he's safe for now, but let's just wait for that next obstacle, and that is the local elections at the beginning of May. We were promised a emergency legislation on Rwanda, but that's now been delayed and kicked the other side of Easter. What's going on in the Lords? A lot of uh, Tory MPs can't understand this, so it's, ba it's now officially back with the Commons. But there's still time for it to go through before Easter when MPs break up next week. But the government have decided that that legislation will be voted on will be after Easter. So there's still another month to have go. They, have they just sent them off on holiday for, to, to avoid them plotting? Is that what they've done? Effectively, sent them home early? Effectively, they've said, pack your suitcases <laughs> and go back and campaign for us in the local elections. But it could help the Conservatives just before those local elections because they'll have that great dividing line, the Rwanda legislation that they can say they've just passed before people go to the polls. Brian, do you reckon there will ever be a flight to Rwanda? Under, under this government? I think they could go off in the summer. No, uh, Labour must be laughing their heads off at this again. How was the mood over there? So you would think they'd be laughing their heads off at yet more of this Tory psychodrama and infighting, which we as journalists will never turn down. <laughs> yeah. However, what I get when I speak to the top brass in the Labour Party is that there really is this idea that there should be no complacency. We know working in news that any event in the 24-hour news cycle can change things with the click of a finger, and they do not want to mess this up. This is a real opportunity they have after the disaster of the Corbyn years, and they are doing everything they can to make sure they don't miss it. Do you, did Labour really think there was going to be an election in May, or were they just causing trouble and wanted to make Rishi Sunak look like a chicken? Labour knew there was never going to be an election <laughs> in May. They were having fun playing politics. They whipped up a non-story into a story, it being a non-story because it was never going to happen. Um, some media outlets went along with it. Some members of the public and journalists maybe thought there was some sort of teeth to it. There wasn't. It was never going to happen. Um, and as we read in your column, Harry, it's looking like it will be an October election for now. And will they make it to October, Ryan? The, the way things are going, surely at some point the Prime Minister is going to come under unbearable pressure, as you say, after local elections, just to, just to 
put it out of its misery. Yeah, I, I think he can get there. I just don't think there is that uh, that energy within the Conservative MPs to actually change the uh, change the leadership again. I think what it would look to the public, it'd be absolutely horrendous if you changed it again. There'd be, you know, Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, all within this parliament. I just think it'd be far too much. Do you think there's anything that the Tories can do to turn this around, or is just the benefit of the doubt gone? Is the, is the country ready for change, or as Noah said, could there be some sort of black swan disaster that changes the narrative all again? There is possibly, I mean, on, on the plus side, you can see England winning the uh, European Championships. You can see us winning uh, gold medals <laughs> in every event in the Olympics. But I, I think really, and I think the fact that the economy is turning around, just like in the sort of mid 90s, it will be seen as being safe to hand over to Labour. So people will be willing to give them a run at uh, running the country. No, when do you reckon the election's really going to be October? Do you think they'll get to there? Gosh, this question is getting so tedious, but I understand <laughs> it's so important to everyone. I do think at the moment we're looking around September, October, because I think Jeremy Hunt will want one more go at getting some tax cuts in, doing some sort of big red meat policy to the electorate to say, please give us one more chance. And will it work? The last two rounds of tax cuts haven't seemed to move the dial. Do you think it'll work? Well, some say the definition of insanity is trying <laughs> the same thing over and over again. I mean, we always welcome a tax cut, but is it enough? I don't think it is at this point. No, but Ryan, we're going to hold it there for a sec. But now it's time for the weather. The political weather, that is, with The Sun on Sunday's political editor, Kate Ferguson. How's it looking out there, Kate? Thanks, Harry. Well, welcome, everybody, to The Political Weather, where each week we will be taking the temperature of things in Westminster. We'll be looking at who's been causing a political storm, which of our politicians is hot right now, and who is in the deep freeze. And of course, as it's election year, we will be checking in on those all important polls to see who's ahead in the race for number 10. Now, a storm has certainly been brewing in Westminster this year. And her name? It's Penny Mordaunt. Tory plotters trying to oust Rishi Sunak from number 10 and now rowing in behind Penny as their number one choice to replace him. Now, Penny's probably best well known for carrying a sword perfectly straight during the King's coronation. And she has not said a word publicly about the plot. But her rebel backers reckon she could be the woman to unite the party and take the fight to Labour in an election. So will those howls of anger at Rishi Sunak's leadership become winds of change? And will the Tories change their leader and select a fifth PM in just five years? Or will the penny plotters get all puffed out? Now, things are certainly stormy on the Tory benches, but there is one politician with plenty to feel sunny about, and that's Labour's shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves. She's dubbed herself the new Iron Chancellor, and she has had lots of glowing write-ups comparing her to the original Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. So, is Britain about to get a powerful new Labour Chancellor? someone who's already being talked up as a possible future leader and PM? What could possibly go wrong, I hear you say? Now, Rachel Reeves might be feeling hot right now, but there are quite a few Tories sending shivers down the spine of number 10 at the moment. One Tory big beast firmly in the deep freeze is this guy, George Osborne. The ex-Chancellor keeps chatting to his old pals at Downing Street and then immediately going on the radio and spilling their secrets. Most recently, he was telling all about the splits in number 10 over calling a May general election. The result? Things are distinctly frosty between Boy George and Tory HQ right now. And finally, let's check in on those all important polls. And wow, well, look, it does look like those Tory storms are still battering their chances of re-election. The latest YouGov poll of Labour on a whopping 44% and the Tories are lagging well behind on just 19 Meanwhile, reform are coming up on the outside on 15%. So, Zakir is 25 points ahead of Rishi in that race for number 10. So things are looking gloomy indeed for the Tories out there. Back to you, Harry. Thanks, Kate. Looking stormy, stormy out there. Noah, what was, uh, what was your story of the week? My story of the week, Harry, was this row that we see unfolding in the cabinet and among the Tory backbenchers about housing. Mm. Now, let me tell you, I buy all my avocados myself <laughs> and I still am very, very much without some sort of lottery win or some sort of miracle far away from buying a house. So 
The Tories... Younger voters are not, not flocking to the Tories for reasons like that? Sorry? Younger voters are not flocking to the no. Tories for that very reason. Well, I think that's one of a plethora <laughs> of reasons. Um, but one Tory manifesto promise in the 2019 general election that um, our old friend Boris Johnson spoke about all the time was reforming the way rent works. Mm. Um, this, po this policy to end what is called Section 21 notices, no fault evictions where a landlord can kick a tenant out of a property when they've done nothing wrong, when they don't even want to sell the property or use it themselves. They just want to kick the tenant out. Uh, the Tories promised to ban it. This was really popular. It has support across Labour, the Lib Dems. But there is a group of backbenchers in the Tory party, many of whom just so happen to be landlords themselves, who are doing whatever they can to kill the bill. Now, this is causing a really big headache for number 10 mm. because it's a Tory manifesto promise. They need to get it out of the way before a general election to avoid giving Labour even more ammunition. But Rishi Sunak doesn't want to face another embarrassing situation where the bill comes back to the Commons and swathes of his own backbenchers pile into the no lobby to vote against Do, him. Doesn't seem like Michael Gove is having much luck. He didn't get any money in the budget no. for housing. He's got his, all of his bills are in, in, in ice because he can't get them through. Any chance of him making a sort of bold stand before the end, do you think? Is he, is he going to die in a ditch for this policy? I think there's a lot of frustration within the Department for Housing, but I don't think he's ready to cause yet another headache for a very struggling party right now. Ryan, just very quickly, we just saw there in the weather the reformer coming up the outside, as Kate put it, and it could overtake the Tories. Surely if that happens, then there's going to be absolute meltdown on the benches, right? Yeah, I think it's really, really serious threat from uh, from the Reform Party. And this is even without Nigel Farage. Absolutely. You can imagine what he does. He's got he's got making that decision pretty much right now whether he's going to come back for, for that election at the, at the end of the year. And if he does, he'll cause real ruptures throughout the Conservative Party. He's that figurehead. He was that figurehead of Brexit. And you just wonder whether he becomes that magnet for a lot of Conservative voters. Or is he having too much fun on TV? Uh, Ryan, no, let's, uh, let's leave it there. It's time to meet the man who looks set to be Britain's next Prime Minister. I'm Harry Cole, and this is Nevermind the Ballots. Right, the moment you've been waiting for. The man of the hour, Sir Keir Starmer. Welcome to Nevermind the Ballots. Thank you very much for having me on. It's good to see you. We've, um, we asked our readers uh, to submit questions to you. And literally hundreds of them did so. We've got some brilliant questions, so thank you to Sun Readers for sending them in. Um, we've sort of had a look through all of them, really, and there was a recurring theme that came up um, through them, and that's the word trust. Um, they remember you from the Corbyn days. They remember you from the Brexit wars. They remember you from the Labour leadership election. And the Keir Starmer that sits here before them today is a very different Keir Starmer to the one that they knew before. Before we start on the questions, I want to show you something. This is from our friends at JL Partners, they're pollsters. They've asked 2,000 British voters what they think of you in one word. And that big red word, untrustworthy, sticks out. It's quite definitive, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there's other ones in there. Some good, <laughs> some bad. I've, I've, but, had a, I've, had, I've had worse. I've had well, I think we took a, I think we took a couple of them out. But, <laughs> but what is some of the people I play football with have been yeah. uh, busily submitting Incompetent their... or dependable, that one. But untrustworthy <laughs> does, does stick out there. Look, why don't people trust you? Well, look, I've been very clear since I came into politics that I'm in here... Uh, to do a job of change. I mean, I came into politics late in life. I'd run the Crown Prosecution Service and I came in to change things and to improve the country. And that's what I've been doing for the last nine years. And that's what I want the chance to take to the country this year uh, This year in the it election. Does, it does seem to happen a lot, though, doesn't it? You, you, you say one thing to try and get one job and now you're saying something completely different to get a different job. You, you chop and change. No, I don't accept that, Harry. I mean, if you look at... Uh, what I said uh, in order to become leader of the Labour Party, a good deal of that has now fed into the missions that I launched last year that you studied carefully. A good deal of it's gone to the wayside, though. Well, most of it is still there in the missions that are there. But some things have had to change, sadly. So, for example, when I was running for Labour leader, I said that we would abolish tuition fees. Mm. Um, now, five years on, with the economy where it is, it's simply not affordable. And I've got a choice to make with the electorate, which is, do I be upfront before the election about what we actually can afford and what we can't? Um, or do I pretend we can deliver something which so, I know we actually can't? And I'm in the camp of saying, look, what I don't want to have is a situation where after the election, um, we're breaking our promises and therefore I'm taking the decision before the election. So you're taking the hit now well, rather than breaking promises after? I would rather look the public in the eye now and say, 
Uh, there are things I would have liked to have done, but we can't afford to do it because the Tories have broken the economy. And I'm being straight with you. Rather than going to an election saying, I can do all these wonderful things, mm. and guess what? Just like you've been let down before, afterwards, uh, we won't be able to deliver it. I'm not going to do that. On your track record, though, you can understand why our readers think that you would say one thing, and they're worried that you're saying stuff now, and then once you get in power, you're going to do something completely different. What uh, do you say to that? Look, we've... we've set out very clearly the change we want to bring about in the country. You've heard myself and Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, mm. set out how careful we're going to be with the money, the public money, recognising that's taxpayers' money, and really set out some tight rules about uh, fiscal responsibility and how much we value public money. That's very unusual for an opposition to set out that sort of detail so far off from an election. But we've done it deliberately because we know that trust really matters in this election. I think there are two um, groups of people in this election looking at all of us, including me. Mm. Um, one group say, look, the country is so broken now, it's not possible to fix it. And another saying, um, I don't really trust any politicians. We've got to meet mo both those challenges. Uh, talking of elections and trust, most of our readers, a lot, this came up a lot from our readers, they remember you standing next to your friend, Jeremy Corbyn, in 2019. You said this, I'm 100% behind Jeremy Corbyn. I am working with Jeremy Corbyn to try and win the next general election. I think that's critical. When you told some readers to vote for Jeremy Corbyn, did you mean it? I didn't think we'd win the 2019 so election. You, so you didn't mean it? I didn't think we would win. I didn't think we were so ready. You can see... And now, hear me out, Harry. Now we're at the stage we are in 2024, and I can see what it means to be ready for an election and ready for government. I see even more clearly how we weren't ready in 2019. But you stood but in did front I, of the voters and said, it's I was it's standing critical. for an election as a Labour candidate, just as every Tory was standing supporting Boris Johnson, whether they actually support yeah. him or not. And just as they will stand and support Rishi Sunak into this election, whether or not they actually um, support him, uh, because uh, I was standing as a Labour candidate in the last election. Another thing people remember before very well is Brexit. They, you, you vowed to respect the result of the referendum. There's video clips of you saying that. But then you spent years spearheading attempts to block it. This came up time and time again from our readers. You ultimately tried to put it to another vote, having said you'd respect the result. Can you understand how that looks to, to our readers and why they don't trust you on Brexit? Well, look, on Brexit, I think we have to cast our minds back. The country was completely divided. We had, what was it, three years of arguments of different positions. The Tory party was divided. My party was divided. The country was divided. And we were all trying to find a way forward. What I did do was we voted through the Brexit deal um, after the last general election. Now, I did that because I thought it was the only way for the country to move forward. I still think we could get a better deal. I think we should be able to trade more freely with Europe. I think that we should have a closer defence and security set of arrangements with Europe. But I've completely accepted the result. I voted for the Brexit deal. And we need to look forward and certainly not look back. I don't think anybody wants to go back to that period of division. But so on the key fundamentals, free movement, yes or no? No. Customs union? No. Some of your front benches are a bit wobbly on that when you ask them privately. They think that there's a... They're not when I ask them. <laughs> Single market. No. So you can't go back kaput. into those institutions. Does that hurt you, though? Because you love the EU. Well, look, I, I worked with the EU. When I was um, chief prosecutor for five years, running all the prosecutions in England and Wales, I worked with my counterparts across Europe because we had to deal with terrorist gangs that were working in Europe. We had to deal with people that were smuggling guns and drugs across Europe. And so I felt that that was a very important thing that we should have. And I still want us to be able to work in that way. Do but you look, still wish we were in the EU? Look, we've left. There's but do no you go wish we were still in we've the left, EU? There's no, I mean, Harry, I'm not going to go back and reopen those divides. I voted sounds for... Like a, sounds like a yes. No, no, no. I voted for Remain. I wanted us to remain. Um, the country voted out, and that's why, after the last election in 2019, I voted for a Brexit deal, and we are now out. We're not going back in, um, but I think that we mm. all have to recognise that, you know, the economy is not in a good place, our public service is not in a good place, and my job, if I'm privileged enough to win the election, will be, as it were, to pick the country up, fix the immediate problems and take our country forward so we can genuinely say after five or ten years this country is now better than it was in 2024 uh, when we were elected into office if we are elected into office. On the issue of Brexit obviously that came up the second one that came up a lot 
second most most questions we had was immigration. I was going to read, so give you a snapshot of some of the anger that came into our inbox. How can he be trusted on immigration when he opposes Rwanda? He opposed the deportation of convicted foreign criminals. He supported open borders and mass immigration. One reader. Another one. How can he be trusted on Brexit? Well, we've covered that. We're refusing to recognise the will of the British people. You know, another reader writes, what's his actual plan to stop the boats? Because he just shouts, smash the gangs. The Tories tried that, not least with the millions of quid they gave to France. What is your real plan? Well, look, Harry, I'm a pragmatist and I'm not here just to make headlines. I think Rwanda is a gimmick for reasons I'll set out in a minute. But what I would do... You're allowed to make headlines, though, if you want to. Well, but, but, <laughs> uh, look, you can. You can. <laughs> we have to stop the boats. We cannot go on like this. The government's lost control of the boats. Yeah. So we've got to stop the boats. And I'm very serious about that. I understand why people are concerned. This sense that we no longer control who's coming here is palpable. It's got to stop. If you're going to stop the boats, you need to recognise there are gangs that are running this trade and putting people in the boats in the first place. They have got boats that are pretty well being made to order. They're being kept in bits of Europe and transported to the coast and people are being put in them. I do not accept that it's impossible to take that down. I personally was involved in... Um, joint operations to defeat mm. terrorists across Europe. And I know what can be done. And don't tell me that can't be this done. They've been but, trying this already. The National Crime Agency are already doing all the, trying to smash these gangs. Well, I'm not sure what, that's true. If you, if, if if you look at some of the reports, there's reports that the information isn't getting exchanged properly, quickly enough. I think we can have a better set of relationships. Mm. If I was the Prime Minister, I'd be knocking on the doors of our European leaders, say, we need to crack this with a joint task force to crack and break these gangs. So we have to do that. Uh, but do you think you know, that, that will solve well, it? Well, contrast that with Rwanda, because Rwanda, mm. um, at the very most, is going to remove about 300 people. And if the planes were going, there, you'd there ground them. There are 130,000 people. So the mm. chance of anyone... Yesterday, I think, we had a record number for this yeah. year crossing the channel. So the idea that the Rwanda scheme is putting them off is quite hard to make. Those people have got something like a 99.5% chance of never being on the plane. That isn't a very good deterrent so to my mind. That grounding, isn't you, the flights get going, you, you, you would ground them. Every, just, single, yes no? every single person on the, on the flight, if there is a flight, 300, is going to cost the taxpayer £2 million. It's expensive. I think it's but, an expensive gimmick. I don't think it will work. I would do the hard yards, more mundane, I accept, of actually taking the gangs down in the first place that are running this show. It's getting a bit heavy. Let's have a little, let's have a little <laughs> break, shall we? <laughs> so amongst our many questions, um, we had some very urgent questions from Sun readers. Um, these are 100%, definitely, almost all questions from our readers. <laughs> almost all, Harry. Just Sir Keir Starmer, what is your favourite crisp flavour? Salt and vinegar. Always Very has good. been, always will be. Curry order. Well, I'm vegetarian. Right, but they even So, chana work. masala, vegetable curry, something like that. Do you like share that? your curry or do you, do you hoard it like Smithy? We share it. My wife's a vegetarian. My daughter's a vegetarian. Our son is not a vegetarian because <laughs> when he was 10, we said, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Sounds So we, he'll have a lovely chicken curry alongside our vegetable curries. But yeah, we share it. What's the worst date you've ever went on? Oh, come on, Harry. I'm not going to reveal that on your <laughs> programme or why. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> How much was a pint of milk? Mm. Pint of milk, about uh, £1.10. Ah, you get 85p in the co-op. Do you have any tattoos? No, I don't. Are you, Are you suggesting <laughs> this I, might improve our chances in the election? What's your weirdest habit? These are all these are all readers' questions. Weirdest habit? Oh, I don't know what my weirdest habit is. And again, no answering questions. No, no. <laughs> people say, "What you know? What, what's the wildest thing you've done? What's your weirdest habit?" Nobody in their right mind answers those questions live on air. All right, you might do this one. Um, was it wrong for Nike to change the? Uh, it's Cross of St George on the back of the New England kit. Yeah, I think it was. And I think what it's was hard... What they were doing? Look, I mean, as you know, I'm a big football fan. I go to England games, mm. men, the women's game, um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unified... It doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. All right. I'm, I'm not even sure they can properly explain, explain why they thought they needed to change in the first place. Last but, uh, but one more thing on that for me. On. They could also reduce the price of the shirts. I think, I think, we, can all, I think we can all get behind, pounds. All get behind that. Um, what was the last book you read? And very important caveat that wasn't that biography about you recently. <laughs> <laughs> Who says I've read it? Um, I'm reading... You half of it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a book by Melissa Bailey at the moment that I'm reading, Lost at Sea, which is an intriguing book. So I'm in the middle of that. I haven't finished it yet, 
but I'm, I'm halfway through. And one more before we go on to the, to the heavy stuff again. Your tipple after a hard day in the office? Pale ale. Ooh, I'll buy you one after this, if you're good. Right, enough of the easy stuff. Let's talk about pensions. Oh, actually, no, hang on. One more before pensions. It's sort of linked. Capital gains tax, your favourite subject. Angela Rayner says she's got no questions to answer about capital gains tax, but the electoral roll states that for at least five years she lived apart from her husband while her brother lived with her husband. Do you believe that? Yes, Angela has explained herself. She's taken legal advice and tax advice. Are you going to publish that legal advice? Assured. Well, look, that's a matter um, for Angela. But look, of course I believe her. Um, but her neighbours say she's lying. They're on the record saying it's not true. But look, Angela's explained herself. She's taken legal advice and tax advice. Um, and they're absolutely clear there's no tax to play. And, and I think that's the long and the short of it. Do you not think that we need to be able to see that? Because there are obvious questions that are being asked very publicly that haven't really been fully answered without seeing this independent tax advice. Look, one, that's a matter for Angela. And two, for all I know, um, the advice might go into the personal circumstance of her living arrangements. She had real But you difficulties. expect the highest levels of honesty and trust in your... Yeah, I do, but I also respect basic um, privacy. I mean, there's issues there about her son, I think, mm. and I'm very protective of my own children. Um, and I'm perfectly um, willing to protect the privacy of others who want to protect their children. I don't I mean, I don't know what um, Angela's position on it is, but look, she's explained Didn't herself. You know, the leader of the party. No, I mean, in, 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 the, in, the legal invi- I mean, in the legal advice, there are issues about her son, as you know. Was but you're taking out all... her word that, that it's all fine, or have you seen this legal advice? No, I've, I've taken her word, but I also do know the legal advice has been given and the tax advice. But have you given. seen it? No, I haven't. So you're just taking it, it's all a matter of trust, you're all above board, and you're just taking it. Well, I know word. what the conclusion of the advice is, yeah. Okay. All right, let's move on. One question that came up even much as immigration. Will you pledge, Sir Keir Starmer, to keep the pensions triple lock for the full five years of the next parliament if you're lucky enough to be prime minister? Well, I believe in the triple lock. I don't think the government should have opened this debate up saying they would keep to it. Um, Obviously, we'll have to see what the state of the economy is as we go into the election. We will publish all of our plans as we go in and answer that question. But I believe in the triple lock. The triple lock is going to be in your next manifesto, right? Well, look, we'll have to set that out when we get to the you manifesto. Know how, you know how many emails we're going to get about this? Because you're not committing to it there, and it's one of the most live wires of political politics. I believe in the triple lock. The government says it believes in the triple lock. It should never have opened this debate up. We will set out everything be- fully costed our manifesto when we get to that point, as you will so expect and as you will see. To be clear, you're not confirming to keeping the triple lock for the full five years of the next parliament if you're lucky enough to be prime minister. We will look at the state of the finances as we go into the election and only make promises we can keep, I, but I believe in the triple lock. I think, we've, I think we can take it from that what we will. Waspy women, damning report today. Lots and lots of emails about this today. Um, are you going to pay that compensation if it's found to be... Is, would the Labour government pay up? Well, we're going to have to look carefully at that report. Um, I haven't had the chance to go through it myself yet. I think, as I understand it, there are a, a number of different proposals in it. So we will, as the government, I think, is doing, look at the report and consider it. It's going to be a hefty bill, though. You've got the post office uh, horizon payouts. You've got the infected blood billions, billions to reverse troop cuts. Are you still committed to that, by the way? Reversing the troop cuts? Yes. Good. All right, that's another 20 billion. Where are you going to get this money from? You're going to put up taxes, aren't you? No, Harry, we have, what we've done is every time we've said we're going to do something, we've carefully set out how we're going to fund but it. The, the only really problem, the only problem do doing that is every time we come up with a very good idea like abolishing the non-DOM tax status for those super rich who don't pay their tax in this country, the, gov- the government comes along <laughs> and steals our good ideas. So, so you are going to keep lip- a few of them under wraps. Read your lips moment under Keir Starmer and no new taxes. Look, where we, we are going to put up taxes, we've already said that, in relation to VAT on private schools, the non-DOM tax status, um, some of the loopholes that we've identified. What about national insurance? Are you going to put that back up? No, we, we've argued that national insurance shouldn't uh, go up, and we, we do not want to see um, increases in tax for working people. We think they've been overly burdened already. Right, let's change the subject. Another, another popular one. Anthony asks... Does Sir Keir Starmer still believe that men have cervixes and women have testicles? Yeah, Harry, look... It's um, a fair question. It is. And, you know, the whole issue here has to be treated with yeah. respect respect and dignity. And, I, and the, the Labour Party has fought for women's rights all its life and will continue to do so. But this and goes, back to, it goes back to the trust thing, though, doesn't it? You said you were going to bring in a gender reform act and now you're saying you're not, or... Are you actually going to bring in a general well, reform act ha- and actually you're waiting into power to actually bring it in without telling anyone? Well, Harry, look, what 
on gender reform. We looked at what happened in Scotland and we learned lessons. And I, you know, you put to me this sort of thesis that anybody who ever um, adapts their position <laughs> is, is not um, fit. But I came into this job late in life. I worked as chief prosecutor for five years with, with 7,000 staff. I've worked with businesses. I've worked in the private mm. sector. In the real world, outside of politics, when circumstances change, people adapt their position. I've not been in a business meeting where something has happened, which means the original plan decision can't mm. happen, where people don't say, we can't do that anymore. Let's adjust it and do what we can do. It is, and, and everybody watching this or reading this will also have the experience. We've all got it at home. You, you make a decision you're going to do something. Then there's a change of circumstance. You have to say, well, I'll have to do something else now. That is plain common sense. And one of the straitjackets that we do in politics is say, yeah. you can never, ever adapt to the circumstances. So have you if adapted, I didn't adapt... Have you adapted on, on, on this key issue? September 2021, you said it's, it's wrong to say only women can have a cervix. Have you adapted on that now? We've set out our position very clearly, um, Harry, that... Um, this my reader know, here says, how can we trust him with the fundamentals of running a country, including the responsibility for the nuclear codes, if he's unable to define half of the electorate? Now, this is just reducing a really serious but issue... But it's a trust to... thing. What do you actually believe? Tell us. Well, look, everybody knows that there's a difference between sex and gender, um, and I absolutely understand that and respect that. We will not be going down the road of self-identification. Are trans women women? Well, look, Harry... It's a fair comment. It's a fair question. Look, for... As you well know, the overwhelming majority... Uh, of women, it's a biological issue. It's an issue mm. um, that is absolutely central to you. Said there are some that. people. There's a small number of people in this country who are born into a gender they don't identify with, mm. um, and they are often um, go through a pretty hellish, um, you know, abuse. I think most people would say, if we can find a way to be respectful to yeah. um, all the women we must properly respect, and we've um, defended their rights and advanced their rights as a party and as a movement for many, many years, and we'll continue to do so, um, then fine. But we won't, and I don't think we should, simply abuse, ignore, make fun of, mock... I don't think there's anyone's um, mocking it. I think it's, I think it's I fair, really, fair I just, I actually... I think I there's think... something more here, which is... One of the turns we've taken in the last 10 years that I think or so um, is this sense that we must always divide. We must find mm. the points of difference and try to make a toxic sort of argument of every issue. It is possible to say um, we can do this better, we can do this differently. And I, I genuinely think and hope that as we go into this election, that ability to build bridges, bring the country together is, is desperately, desperately needed. I know you want to talk about crime. It's our last... Our last big topic, and you want to talk about crime, and, but there is another trust issue here as well. Yeah, I'm going to read you some, a selection of our, our readers' questions. Look, I know the story. You locked up so many terrorists and pedos that the Queen made you a knight. Like, you know, we, we've heard the... We've heard I don't the, think uh, Rishi Sunak has got that <laughs> message yet. But you also worked for a lot of wrong didn't you? I was... Look, I was Chief Prosecutor for five years. I prosecuted with my team of you also defended 7,000 prosecutors. Characters. We prosecuted nearly a million cases a year, including terrorists, murderers, drug dealers, etc. I, I, I was a lawyer before that, and in the legal world, um, uh, particularly if you're doing criminal law, Cabrack. you... you well, you represent people you don't agree with. OK, but, but, you, chose, but, but you chose I, to represent the terrorist group. No, 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 Harry, that, come on. Um, you know how it works in our legal system. But it is very important that everybody is represented. Now, if you're putting to me that you want to take that away, or you think I'm it's a good not idea... To you. I'm just asking whether you regret any of these people you represented. Let's start with it used to, It used to be a sort of basic tenet of Conservative Party philosophy that our legal the system Cabrang was fair, where people thing, but would But choosing have... to defend Hizbut Tahrir in the European Court's human rights, to stop them being banned from Germany, did you take money for that? Yes, it was, it was a case where I was asked for... I didn't actually represent them in court. You, were, you, you advised their, their, their case in court. You, they, advi you, advi you were contributed to their legal defence. Lawyer gives legal advice. Yeah, to terrorists. That was my job. Doctor treats patients. All right, what about al-Qaeda terrorist <laughs> Abu Qatada to help him get more welfare benefits? Look, Do you regret that one? As a lawyer, you um, are uh, taking cases uh, within your field of specialism... Um, whether you agree... And whether you agree with the client or not is... Of course I don't agree with these um, people, but that doesn't um, adjust the principle that in our legal system our... we have 
representation of both sides. And if you took that away, if you, if you conducted this interview with a Crown Court judge um, and suggested that certain people should not have legal representation, they would say, you're out of your mind, you're going to ruin the criminal justice system and you're going to make the backlog ten times longer than it Let is now. Let me give you one more. Al Fawes, Al-Qaeda's spokesman in the UK, wanted in the US for helping to plot with bin Laden. You, you the, tried to stop him being extradited. You're giving different examples. The principle is exactly the same. No man. regrets. Lawyer gives legal you've advice. Never, it never looks... Never, it has hit the pillow one night. You've never thought, oh, I wish I hadn't done that one. But look, lawyers represent clients. Doctors um, treat patients. The, the fact a doctor p treats a patient doesn't mean the doctor agrees with what the patient's mm. beliefs are. You can are. see why people are a bit... Squeamish about it. Though. I think you should test them, Harry, and say... And, and, these are their, these are their no, suggestions. No, 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 you should test people and say, do you really want a legal system where some people are simply unrepresented? Do you actually think it would help our legal but, system? So just to be clear, you don't regret a single case you took part in? Look, uh, Harry, I uh, represented different people in different ways. I also prosecuted, in the end, hundreds of thousands of criminals, you... many of whom are still in jail, for some of the biggest terrorist plots. We had one plot where it was a plot to bring down seven aeroplanes across the Atlantic at the same time. And working with my prosecutors and the police, we managed successfully to prosecute that case. They got 40 years and they're still serving their terms. So... Um, you know, it is very important that people see both sides of this. On the Crown Prosecution Service, there's a question that did come up a lot in our emails, and I want to hear your version of events. You said you take full responsibility for every decision the Crown Prosecution Service made when I was Director of Public Prosecutions. Does that still stand? Yes, of course it Every does. single decision? Yes. Including the decision, wasn't, didn't cross your desk, you say, but the CPS's failure to prosecute Jimmy Savile. Do you accept responsibility for that as the guy in charge? Uh, the first I knew about this was after he died. Mm -hmm. um, I asked for a review into whether his case had ever come onto the desk of any of my prosecutors anywhere in the country. As a result of my review, it transpired that in Surrey and Sussex, um, somebody had come forward to make an allegation, but the local prosecutors in Surrey and Sussex had taken the decision, along with the police, uh, not to prosecute. I looked into that after the event. I didn't see these cases. Mm. They didn't come to my desk. Um, but you said you take full at... responsibility for everything. Yes, and, and that so is, you, that the, is... buck, the buck stops with you. That's why, having reviewed the cases, I asked my principal legal advisor to review the cases. Um, we, I issued, on behalf of the service, uh, an apology because um, the service had not connected the two cases gotcha. together. Uh, in each case, the complainant said they didn't want to go on with the case. So the question is whether that could have been done differently. But I think you've got to be really careful here, Harry. This did not cross my desk. No, no, I've, I've, I've um, made that clear, but I just wanted to make sure you, you know, where exactly let you set out your position, because people are interested in it. And I but, suspect it's going to come up again. Yes, but it's been weaponized by Boris Johnson. Do you still think it was a smear, though? Because you did say... It you was a smear, yeah. But you but, accept full responsibility for everything that happened under your watch. So you, how is it a smear? Well, you heard the way Boris Johnson put it to me, and you it saw what feels happened... feels like years ago, actually, doesn't it? Well, it does, yeah. but, I mean, you saw what happened in the street just weeks later when yeah. um, uh, there was an incident in the street with people coming over uh, to me as a direct result of what he said. Yeah. Let's... Um, we're getting heavy again, so we're going to end up by our section. We're going to talk to the Sun Cabinet at a moment, but I'm going to ask you some more light-hearted questions. Very good. But hard questions. Very good. These are the questions that have stumped previous aspiring Prime Ministers. Very good. What's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? Is well, Harry, again... <laughs> the... <laughs> Theresa May answered, and she never yeah, answered questions. Nobody gives an honest answer <laughs> to that, do they? Because how, how do you come on here and say what's the naughtiest thing you've ever Go done? On, give us a little. Give us a no, point. I'm not going to do that. Oh, it's going to get worse. Are you religious? Tony Blair's famous question. No, I'm not. I'm a great belief believer in faith, but I'm not personally religious. How many children do you have? I have two children. Boris Johnson question. And now I can't believe I'm going to do this on television, but um, the Nick Clegg question. How many people have you slept with? And I'm not going to answer that one <laughs> you, been, either, you didn't Harry. walk into that, did you? Yeah. But one you've been asked before, like David Cameron, you've been asked this before. You didn't answer it, though. When did you last take illegal drugs? Oh, Harry, I had a good time when I was a student. What does a good time when you're a student look like, though? It means I had a good time when I was a student. But what does that mean? It means I had a good time when so I was a student. Some spliffs, doing some acid, partying, drugs. What, what was it? A good time. You're not answering the question, are you? I had a good time when I was a student. Did you ever do drugs after you left university? Look, I had a good time when I was a student, and how, whichever way you put this, Harry... Did you do drugs when you were a lot? Look, Harry, I'm not going down that road. You can see why people think you're untrustworthy, though, when you won't answer a simple question. Well, I've 
explained. I had a good time at university, and that's as long and the short of it. There is nothing. You know, everyone there. at home is thinking the answer to the question is is yes, though. I think if you look, I mean, Tom Baldwin just did a big book on me, as you know, and um, I haven't read it. Search. Yet, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, read, must, I, I read your book. All right, I, read I will your read book. it. I, I will read. So you've I will got read to read it. it. Okay, fine. I will read it. Let's start there for a moment, though. We're going to bring in our son cabinet. Thank you, Keir. I think <laughs> we covered some 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 solid ground there. If your question wasn't read out, I'm sorry, but there were hundreds of them. You've heard from the Labour leader. Next, the verdict. The Sun Cabinet meets Sir Keir Starmer. This is Never Mind the Ballots with me, Harry Cole. Still with me is Sir Keir Starmer. And joining me now to give their reaction to our interview, some of the Sun's Cabinet. Dr Pashi Makajay, the Sun's Health Secretary, an NHS doctor and trainee GP. Grant Davies, our Transport and Energy Secretary and London Cabby. And Carrie Ann Booth, the Sun's Education Secretary, former science teacher. Grant, I'm going to start with you. What did you make of Keir's interview? I enjoyed it more than I thought I would, actually. Oh, there we go. Are you going to vote for him? Uh, I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for. <laughs> and uh, don't ask that. Um, I don't know who I'm going to vote for, to be honest, Keir. I mean, uh, I like the interview. I like the way you said that you're not going to promise things that you can't deliver. Because, and, and what Harry was saying about the public saying trust. Yeah. Trust. I mean, we've seen so many prime ministers get in and on the run-up say, don't worry, I'm going to sort this out, we'll give you that, we'll get that in. And when they get in power, yeah. they say, oh, you know what, we can't do it. And I think people are just really bored of that now. And, and when you said, we're not going to say we can deliver on this if we know financially we're not going to be able to. I mean, for me, that's a bit refreshing. If yeah, I'm on this. I, 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 Harry will obviously uh, quiz me about that because he says, well, you said before you'd do it and now you're dropping it because you can't afford it. But I think it's really important at this stage for that very reason, Grant, because we just pick up the whole time when we're knocking on doors, etc. people saying, um, I quite like what you're saying, but I don't believe anybody's going to deliver mm -hmm. anymore. And we have to... And that then leads to people thinking, yeah. I won't vote and disillusioned. So we have to overcome that. So if I've got to take difficult decisions this side of the election and say, so, even though I might have wanted to do that, and then you might have said, I quite want that to happen. If we can't afford it, we won't do it. Right. It's, it's tough, but I'd, I'd rather be tough with people now before the election than afterwards. Yeah. Grant, Grant, you had a question uh, about, I think, uh, a topic dear to your heart. Yeah, it was about uh, the whole net, you know, net zero and the green stuff. As a London cabbie. Yeah. Uh, Sadiq Khan, who's a, a Labour mayor, yeah. he brought in new rules over the vehicles. We had to buy, and we still can only buy, one vehicle, a green vehicle, and a London taxi now, believe it or not, if I go out and buy one tomorrow, with interest, is over £100,000. Yeah. Think of how many trips to Waterloo Station I've got to do to pay that back, right? Then, on the top of that, this year, the Labour mayor extended you, Les, I had a perfectly good family car. I've got two kids and a dog, right, and a wife. And I've, uh, I need a family car. We had a really good car, serviced every year. I had to scrap it. I couldn't afford a new car, so I've had to buy a newer second-hand car. So just in them two incidents alone, it's cost feel... me so much money to, to, like, buy into this green vision from the Labour mayor. Where do they think working class people have got this money? Yet? Well, look, I hear you on this because I think it's really important. I do think we need to make the transition. I think we need to go to uh, renewables and clean energy because uh, that's required to, you know, on climate grounds, but it'll also give us lower bills, energy bills. Um, and many businesses are saying to me they can't afford their bills anymore. It'll make sure we've got the next generation of jobs. And also in London and other places, um, we do have to deal with dirty, polluted air. I've got two kids, a 15-year-old boy <laughs> just doing his GCSEs, a little girl who's 13. I don't give them dirty water, and I don't want them breathing in dirty... No. Um, but what I would say, and this is where... So I'm, I'm very committed to that. I, would, I am with you on the fact we can't just cane motorists. We've got to get this proportionate, which is why I was concerned about you, Les, um, because you can't just l put all the financial load on yourself... Well, it's all, it's all, it seems to me it's all stick and no carrot, right? Yeah. yeah. And and even with the extended ULES, the, the Labour Mayor, Sadiq Khan, he won't publish the results of the air quality test until 
after the mayoral election. Now, to me, <laughs> that, okay. that, that really stinks, to be honest, because if we bought into it, we got to know whether he was right or he was wrong. Yeah, I mean, Grant, what I'd say on that is um, I, I have seen some of the medical evidence about the impact. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm determined we've got to do something about this. It's the speed of it, but it It's the speed also... But this is where I am um, really interested in what you've got to say, and genuinely, we can't just dump the cost on drivers. We've got to find a better way of doing that, a proportionate way, because <laughs> otherwise... I mean, as you say, for working-class families trying to run a car, it's hard enough as it is. Yeah, um, yeah. Because sure. Sure. all the other bills have gone up. And so yeah. we have to find a better way of doing it. And that's a fair challenge, and that's what we're working on, Grant. And but to buy Grant, a newer Grant. cab and a newer car, when <laughs> really I didn't want to do both, really. Yeah, no, I understand. I think you, yeah, yeah. But I'm in that situation. So my yeah. disposable income has now really shrunk, yeah. alarmingly so, just so I can... My wife can take the kids to school and I can go to work. We're going to have to move on. Grant, I think you're going to have to take it outside with Sakira after we've gone <laughs> on, on that we'll one. <laughs> yeah. Carrie Ann, what did you make of the, of the interview and our next potential Prime Minister? I thought your questions were tough. Good. Some of those questions well, yeah, were tough. We don't... No, no, no soft, some soft balls here. Uh, some no, of them are personal. Very personal. <laughs> some of them you even answered. Yeah. I wouldn't have answered them either. Um, no, no, the, no. Interview, the interview was good, and I think um, it's, it's nice to hear you just speaking in such a refreshing and warm way. And I think... I think the British public need to see more of the warm, smiley, happy Kia, because I think sometimes you don't always come across as warm as you can be. And I think <laughs> we need to see more of that. And although the election isn't a popularity contest, or it shouldn't be a popularity contest, a lot of voters are going to vote with who they feel a connection mm. to. And I think making that connection with the public is really, really important. No, I think that's really... It is. And, and the challenge is always to get it across, um, because I think probably having been a lawyer, you sort of come with a, a, a tough exterior. And I've, <laughs> I've had to adapt that to... Because I've been asked a lot about my background, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I know uh, a lot of people know this. My, my dad worked in a factory. My mum was a nurse. Um, and we didn't have a lot of money. And therefore, I actually know what it's like not to be able to pay your bills. We had some of our... I mean, the phone was cut off and things like that. And I know it's important, um, however irritated some people get with me saying that, because... People need to know. I do actually know what it's like to sit at the kitchen table. And our family had to decide, what are we not going to have then? Yeah. And in our case, it was the phone, which didn't have mobiles then, by yeah. the way. It was a bigger decision than yeah. you might think. Um, but I think that, because in the end, I'm mean, really interested in your view on this. I think people want to know, do you understand what it's like for me? And can you make it, have you got a sensible plan to make it better? Yeah. And they're pretty important basic questions that people need to have answered. Carry on, you had a question um, for, for Sakir oh, on schools. I've got a few questions. I'm going to go with one from a parental point of view first rather than a teacher point of view. Mm. Um, what is Labour's standpoint on fining parents for taking their children on holiday during term time? Because at the end of the day, it hits those on the lowest income and it feels like yet another tax on the poor. I, look, I do passionately believe that children should be in school during term time. I really do. We never take our kids out. I do understand, I mean, look at any of the centre parks, for example, the week, as soon as the yep. holiday comes, Double the price triples. goes yeah. up and you can see why people say, I'm struggling and I need to make my child out. I get that. I completely get that. And on one level, I can see, I would be quite sympathetic to it. On the other hand, we have to have our kids in school for the whole time. Um, it is so important. Um, for them to have that chance. So will Labour keep those fines, increase those fines? We're not planning to get rid of them. We haven't got plans to increase So they're going them. from 60 to 80 But I, I, my, my worry would be that if you started to reduce or get rid of them, it would become the norm to take your children mm. out of school. Mm. And I think that's a slippery slope. But people are doing it anyway. Uh, people are doing it anyway. The, the yeah. Ha the holidays are expensive, so just take the kids out anyway. No, no. Take the hit with the fine. I'm not sure it does solve the problem. And then where does the money go? Admin and then back into government. No, no, it doesn't I get, feed I... back into the schools. It doesn't help the children. And then those children getting a nice cultural experience and a week out of school can still be just as valid as the week in school they've got. I mean, you might have to put some limits on it, not in exam years, but I took my eight-year-old out of school last year and I think her life was yeah. all the richer for it and our pocket was a little bit fuller because of it as well. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. But I, 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 yeah. I just gutturally feel that we should have our kids in school every day and it's very, very important for them. And we, you know, that, that educate... I mean, you, you know this better than anyone. That is the 
foundation, the base camp for kids as they go forward in life. And if we don't give them every chance, I mean, big champion of state schools, really worried about the state of state schools, the funding, the teacher sort of, you know, retention um, problems and make what I what I want more than anything um, is a society where it doesn't matter whether you go to a state school or a, mm -hmm. a private school. And it currently Our does. kids are at state yeah. school. I want I want it to make no difference um, because the quality of the education you get and the opportunity you get is the same. And so I just, I do think that we've got to keep the rule that you have to be in school on school days. I mean, my kids, by the way, would be absolutely with you <laughs> on this. <laughs> Gary, I'll get you tonight. Yeah, Did you I'll have one more quick that. question for Kim? Oh, my um, very, very wrong, quick one, wrong yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, I might, I might swerve and go on a different question, actually. Um, you are a big fan of state schools, as am I. Um, I love, love the state system. Um, However, if you put the VAT on independent schools, on private schools, I'm worried about the short-term effect, that that's going to have a massive impact on state education because you're going to get those sort of middle-class families who can no longer afford to send their children to an independent school. It's going to put extra pressure on the state schools. It's going to push those class sizes up. They're already at breaking point. We're already losing teachers. I'm not saying I'm averse to the VAT on independent schools because I'm a big state school fan, but I'm worried about that immediate knock-on effect. Yeah. yeah, look, I do understand there are families that uh, um, you know, have two or three jobs making uh, ends meet, trying to pay for their school fees for a private school for their children. I understand mm -hmm. that aspiration. But then there are many, many uh, families who've got the same aspiration at state school. The question I've got to answer, Karen, is this. Um, we haven't got enough maths teachers in our secondary state schools. So you've got, teacher, you've got children in state schools who aren't even getting the basics. And, but Rishi Sunak says he wants maths to 18. Good. I mean, fine. But at the moment, we haven't got enough maths teachers in our state secondaries. So we, what we do this is not a war on private schools. It's simply saying if we're going to fund 6,500 more teachers in subjects like maths, which is what we've got to do, we've got to find the money. Don't think we can put taxes up anymore. People are paying a fortune on tax. I don't think we can cut public services anymore because they're on their knees. So that money, uh, the VAT, will be used to fund those 6,500 teachers so that kids in state secondaries get the teachers they need. Now, these are uncomfortable choices, but that is a choice that I've had to make, which is in order to fund those teachers in secondary schools, I would make the choice of um, charging VAT on private school fees. May I just ask one more question? Very, very, very quick, because we've got to bring in Dr Pasha. How are you going to get those teachers into schools? Because at the moment, you've got over three quarters of teachers who are wanting to leave education completely, and one in ten teachers it's wouldn't okay. even recommend their friends and family. Yeah, we've got to retain teacher. the teacher we've got as well. Yeah. And um, one of the things that uh, we've put in place is um, uh, an sort of enhanced uh, retention scheme for teachers, recognising and allowing them to go up and um, progress within the system more quickly. I've got quite a number of friends who are teachers and, and the burnout is high and retaining them is important. So that's the other plank of our plan. Dr Bashir, what, what do you think? Do you know what, Kia? Before I came here today, I hadn't met you. And I will agree with carrie -Anne that you've got such a bright smile, you should smile more. <laughs> and actually, I think the glasses are a really uh, good talk, addition. Talk us through, talk us through oh, the new uh, glasses. They're, they're a, they so, look good, so they look like good. Quite tight on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, almost everybody loves the glasses. My 15-year-old son, but first day I got them was about two weeks ago now, maybe a bit more. I put them on and I said, what do you think? He said, I wouldn't go out in those if I were you. <laughs> I think you should model but his, for his job is His job is to reduce me. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Pasha, what, uh, what was your question for Sakir Starmer? So, um, as Health Secretary, the debate Our recently Secretary. has been all about the waiting list yeah. in NHS. And I know Labour has pledged to drive down the waiting list by creating appointments and clinics out of hours during weekends and on evening shifts. Now, as a junior doctor myself, you've just got to step into a ward to yeah. see that we're already heavily over yeah. understaffed, overworked, the staff are burnt out, that there's been a massive increase since the pandemic of staff absences, sick leave and mental health. How do you think you're going to incentivize this staff to the same pool of staff to work 
extra hours. Well, we've we got to pay them for doing it. I mean, this scheme isn't uh, sort of please work harder. We can't. I mean, my wife works in one of the big London hospitals, and the idea of saying to the staff, you've got to do more on the same wages is not going to land mm. at all. So this comes with extra money for doing it. Um, but we've got to get those waiting. I mean, now, seven point, whatever it is, six million people. That is, I mean, we have a sort of debrief, my wife and I, almost every night. It is having such an impact on the workforce because they know they can't get through it. So we have to do it. But we've got to do other things. I know you're passionate about this um, because there's a stat I saw today. Seven million people went to A&E because they couldn't get the appointment they wanted with the GP. And as you know, a GP is about £40 for an appointment. A&E is about £400. Mm. That's a huge wasted amount of money. Um, going on because we haven't got the system set right. So the, we need to get those waiting lists down. There are other things that we need to do as well. And I think only Labour in the end has the sort of trust to help and reform this mm. NHS. We're very proud of it, you know, 75 years plus. Uh, my mum was a nurse. My sister was a nurse. My wife's mum was a doctor. I mean, for our family, it's everything. But we've got our job is to make sure it's there for seven, the next 75 years as well. And mm. that's why I've made it one of the big missions for an income. I, I completely hear your point, Kia, but it's not just about the pay. The staff are overworked yeah. and burnt out. And if we're going to take the same pool of staff to work on weekends and essentially pull, pull into their rest time, essentially, there could be patient safety and staff health and safety issues at hand. So what have you got to say yeah, about I mean, that? Uh, one, it would be fully paid. Two, it, it would be voluntary. We'd have to work with the staff. We wouldn't want to, nor would it work, to force them to do it. But there's a secondary challenge, quite right to me, under what you're saying. We, we, we should have been training up more doctors and nurses for many years now to bring them into the system. And so we've got what we call a workforce plan, which is to bring the next generation, because the strain is very heavy. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, I think my wife goes through it with me. It, it, it was really tough before COVID. It was really tough during COVID. And then now the waiting lists um, are bearing down. The staff are feeling, you know, undervalued mm. and under-respected. Mm. Um, and, there's a, and we have to lift lift mm -hmm. that up, mm -hmm. I recognise that. We'll have to do that by working with the staff. Mm -hmm. So, Cabinet, I'm afraid we're out of time. So, Keir, thank you very much. Cabinet, that was brilliant. Uh, even tougher questions than, uh, than mine, I think. It's the best uh, Cabinet meeting I've had in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sakir. You've heard from the Leader of the Opposition. Next week, we will hear from Britain with our exclusive mega poll revealing the state of the nation. Then, after that, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will be with us to see if he can change his mind. So, oh, if you see him, he can change your mind, rather. That was Never Mind the Balance. Thank you very much, and good night.